The following is part of Cornell Contemporary China Initiative Lecture Series under the Cornell East Asia Program. The arguments and viewpoints of this talk belong solely to the speaker. We hope you enjoy. We're very happy to have with us uh, Suzanne Scoggins. Suzanne is just completing her PhD at UC Berkeley in political science, uh, but has been spending the last year as a pre-doctoral fellow at Stanford University. Uh, and is going to speak to us tonight about uh, her new research, uh, Policing in the Shadow of Protest. Uh, she has done a fair amount of work, uh, field work, talking to, uh, working with police officers in China. Uh, very interesting topic, so please join me in welcoming Susan Sukhoi. Thank you, Robin, for the introduction, and I'm so excited to be here at Cornell today to talk about my research, which is on frontline police in China. So the title of the talk today is Policing in the Shadow of Protest, and this is really an acknowledgement of the fact that when we think about police and policing in China, we typically think only about protest. There are a lot of good reasons for this. Uh, I'm going to pick on the New York Times right now, but it's really all of the international press. All of the articles that, that bring up police are something about stability maintenance or protest. And this is often because the Chinese government is so interested in this idea of stability maintenance, right? And we know that the police uh, are actually doing a good job in this regard. So security in China, internal security, is something that the Chinese police do quite well. Uh, we know that in the last, uh, say, 15 years or so, in, in 20 years in the, in the post-Tiananmen environment, the police have proven able to quash rising protests at nearly every turn. And um, this is really important for, for stability maintenance work in China. Yet when you go out and you talk to local police officers and you ask them questions about uh, other crimes, right, like murders or thefts or, or drug crimes, you start to see cracks in that Chinese security state. And it's those cracks that I look at with my research, trying to understand what police actually do and what that might mean, their experiences, experiences in these other areas, what that might mean for something like authoritarian resilience or studies of the bureaucracy. So the truth is that policing in China looks a lot less like this, right, which is what we think, or even this, which is that friendly image of the state that they like to present, and something a lot more like this. So your beleaguered traffic cop on the street is a much better representation of your average police officer in China than those well-armed men in the previous slides. In fact, there, there are a number of police officers in China who've never even been involved in protest control. And when you talk to police, you find out that they are exhausted. They're overworked. They're underpaid. They are almost universally unarmed. So the police in China, the patrol officers, most of them don't carry guns. And they say that they aren't able to manage basic crime issues because of problems like reform failures and funding deficiencies and also structural problems within the bureaucracy, which is what I'm going to be talking about today. So these men and women right here, they're the other face to the Chinese security state. And what they have to say about crime management, in addition to protest control, really matters for how we think about internal security in China and how we understand coercive capacity. So this part of the research really starts out of a question that, um, that I had when I was first going into the field and, and talking to police officers in China. Uh, and that is why, if the Chinese security state is so strong, are police saying that they're doing a good job of managing protest, but struggling with nearly everything else? So you talk to police officers, uh, you ask them about their work, and, and they say, you know, we go out on calls, we, we write our reports, but we're very rarely able to solve the issue at hand. And this ends up leaving them and the people that they're trying to help very dissatisfied. And yet when you ask them about protests, they say, we do pretty well in this regard. And first of all, I was surprised by that. I, I didn't think that that was the, going to be the answer when I asked them about these different types of crime. Uh, but I was also surprised because, you know, protest policing is really difficult. 
uh, you know, Robin said, I come from Berkeley, California. We have a lot of protests where I'm from, right? You talk to our officers. They'll tell you people are emotional. This is difficult work. A lot of times it's a last resort, particularly in China. This is their last resort. So this is an emotional thing for the protesters. So getting them off the streets is, is not easy. And yet, if the police are able to excel in this type of uh, somewhat difficult area of policing, why, is my question, are they not able to replicate those results in these other areas of crime management, which I would argue are more important to everyday feelings of security and stability than protest? So that's, that's the question. Why protest? Why not these other things? And if you look at the literature uh, on policing in China, there's not a lot of it. There's a good bit written in the Chinese language and policing journals, but English language, there's not as much. Uh, you start to wonder, like, why, why would this be happening? So I went back to the literature and thought, well, you know, it might just be about money, right? Fu Hualing wrote a really important piece in 2006 about the underfunding of, of police stations at the local level. So maybe it's that they fund protest but they're just not able to fund these other areas for whatever reason. Uh, I don't know if you guys know this or not, but there, in the last few years there have been headlines about China spending more on internal security than national defense. Uh, and that's true, but that's a very broad category, and there's a misconception that all of that money goes towards stability maintenance work. That, that's actually not the case. It's, it's for all of internal security. It goes to a lot of different departments. So there is a, a but, but there's still money that goes into protest, but it's not as much as, as people think. Um, so while that is, that, that, that would help lend credence to this idea, right? But when you go to the rich stations, the stations where there's a lot of economic development, you see the same pattern as in the poor stations. So even in the rich stations where you would think they'd have the money to spend on these other bits of crime management, you're, you're seeing the same pattern of not doing well with, pro or doing well with protests, but not in these other areas. And then sort of the second, um, the second explanation that you might be able to get out of the literature is that perhaps this is just uh, about campaigns, right? In China, they have these, these crime campaigns. And maybe protest policing is just one big giant campaign, and policing only works well during crime campaigns. But the recent literature coming out of this, uh, there's a guy who does really amazing work, a sociologist called Xu Jianhua at the University of Macau. Uh, he's found and shown that these crime campaigns are actually very ineffective. They're not about you know, improving crime response. It's just about meeting quotas. And he has this great photo of an officer who's gone to, to, uh, to enforce a rule that you can't have uh, small like scooters or, or three-wheeled cars, um, like, like the little San Luncho, right? Uh, and he's just standing in a sea of these cars, these vehicles that are outlawed, they're illegal, and he's riding one ticket. So it's just about he's going to meet his quotas and then he's going to go home. So it's not, it's not just about crime campaigns because we know that crime campaigns are actually not all that effective either. And then finally, the last possible explanation is that it's only these poorly qualified police who are working on protest. So this is, this is what uh, police officers in China, particularly the leadership, will tell you. They say the Su Hindi, their, their character is very low. Uh, these just, men just aren't high quality. So, so you know, maybe it's that the protests are being, held, are being handled by these officers who are better trained. But actually, it's the same officers who say they do well with protests, we don't do well with other things. It's the, the same exact people. And we also know that uh, there's an auxiliary police force called the Xiejing, that uh, they're, they're like the, the assistant police. They're, they're not trained. We know that they're handling a lot of the protest. So it's not just about the, the quality of the police officers who are handling these matters. Uh, so I, I went to China and I did, I, I think I'm up to about 118 interviews now with 56 different officers who are at the local, the provincial, and the central levels. And this is, normally you would see on the map, but, but uh, this is actually in south central China, in central China, and also in northern China. I went to seven different cities and conducted these interviews. Um, and to be quite honest, getting police officers to talk to you in China is not the easiest thing in the world. Uh, I spent a lot of time, I used to, uh, to teach English there. I knew officers before I even started my PhD. So a lot of these relationships developed over time, over multiple interviews, as I got to know officers, uh, built trust with them, and, and uh, got them to open up to talk about their work.
So because, of course, this is a little bit imperfect, uh, I triangulate wherever I can this data from the interviews with you know, archival research, with primary sources. There's actually a lot of information on the web uh, about policing in China. The, the stations have their own websites. The officers have their own social media accounts. You can follow them online. Uh, their crime statistics. And uh, I even spent two months at the Chinese University of Hong Kong doing research where they have a lot of internal documents there that, that are housed in the library. So, so that's how I, I went about getting the, the research for the, uh, for the findings I'm going to present today. And what I ended up uh, coming up with was that this variation, what, what I ended up observing was that this variation in crime response, namely doing well with protests but not in most of the other areas, was actually being caused by different patterns of control that the ministry was using to exert uh, their influence over the local levels. So the first category is what I call unified control. This is centralization, where the ministry is very actively involved in what's going on at the, at the local levels. It's, very, it's a very centralized hierarchical structure. The second category uh, is shared control. And this is sort of the more typical way of thinking about the Chinese bureaucracy. The uh, local governments and the ministry are sharing control of those local levels. So this is a chart of what, um, of, of how things uh, go down in the Chinese police bureaucracy. And what happens is the ministry uh, will take laws from the, uh, the National People's Congress or policy statements from leaders. They turn those into procedures and then they pass that right down the line. Uh, so they're controlling the procedures. But at the same time, the local governments are off to the side and they're the ones who are providing funding for the day-to-day -day operations of the station. So they are also exerting their influence. And sometimes they have different priorities that the, than the ministry. So this is what Chinese police call having two bosses, right, Liang Ge Lao Ban. And uh, that can be problematic in some cases, as, as I'll, I'll talk about. The final category is the one that I think is so interesting, and that's superficial control. This is basically de facto decentralization, where the police on the ground get left to their own devices. Um, and this is where the majority of crime response actually ends up falling. And so we'll talk about why things start off pretty effective when you're at unified control, and as you work your way down, it gets worse and worse. So just to give you uh, some, some more specific examples. So with unified control, this is an issue that is very important. When you see unified control, it means that it's an issue that's very important to the ministry. It's a national priority. It's something that create, that uh, it, it needs a lot of resources. It needs manpower resources. It needs financial resources. Uh, and so unified control is relatively hard to do. And uh, based on the, the, the interviews that I did, the only type of crime response that actually has unified control is the control of social unrest. Now, um, I, I didn't say my, my field work was carried out between 2009 and, and uh, last September, but most of it occurred between 2010 and 2012. And in that period, uh, it was really just social unrest. But since that time, I've started to see some, some signs that corruption, because of the Xi Jinping administration, may be entering this category of, uh, of, of uh, unified control. But for right now, there's only one thing that gets managed this way, and that's social unrest. And what that ends up looking like is that the ministry is very involved, right, because it's centralized. They're active. They have training programs. They send teams down from the ministry, to, down from the central ministry, down from the provincial ministry. Uh, I, I just was, I'm writing a chapter right now on this, and I, I just realized that there are 2,000 articles written by policing scholars between 2005 and 2015 about stability maintenance. So there's a lot of high level thinking going on. You don't, you don't see that level of attention on any other issue, not even, not even remotely close. Um, and so the ministry is active, but it's also the, the, the response ends up being well coordinated. So there are a lot of agencies that are involved in stability maintenance. It's not just the local police, but because the cadre evaluation system 
has holds the local government leaders and the police leaders and the, you know, all the across to stability maintenance and whether or not they have reduced the number of protests or they have a low number of protests, you start to see the, the forces getting on the same page. So the, the, the local governments are less likely to try to go around the ministry and try to do their own thing. They're, they're on the same page. And then there's also a lot of coordination among the various agencies that are involved in that ground level response. So for example, the People's Armed Police, which is a paramilitary force, they can be brought in. The local government leaders can be brought in. The stability maintenance office people can be brought in. There's a lot of coordination on these issues when social unrest occurs. So just to give you a visual, this is Tiananmen Square, or this is actually Tiananmen Gate, uh, during National Week, right? So it's a, it's a sensitive time, it's very important, and during sensitive times, the ministry and the, the national leadership, they don't want protesters showing up to Beijing. They don't want them showing up in the public squares. And so the police are told that they have to keep them from protesting. And the way that they do this is really interesting. They essentially go out and round up all the troublemakers. And they do this several times a year. Uh, and I have a quote here. Uh, he says, well, an officer from Hubei, he says, we have rooms or we'll rent a hotel. We buy them food, let them watch movies. This is also used with student populations. They, they, they show movies in sensitive times. And we keep them for a few days. Uh, this officer was actually pretty funny. He, he enjoyed this kind of work. He thought it was, he was a detective, but he thought it was fun to be able to go out and do this work. And you know, sometimes he said they would drink beer with them. They would get to know them over time. Uh, he also enjoyed the chase. If they ever got away, he, he liked to go and, uh, and catch them on the train or at the, at the, the traffic point. Uh, so there's a procedure here, right? They're resources. They know what to do. They know who these people are. And they know how to prevent those uh, protest events from happening during sensitive times. But of course, that doesn't happen all the time, right? Sometimes you have actual protest. And this is a picture of an actual protest that I just happened upon. I, w I was in Guizhou for a completely different reason. This is, this is on some backcountry road. I think I'm going to the Hot Springs or something in 2007. And these are the villagers. Um, you see the road, you, you can't see it very well, but this road is new and very nice. And these villagers had helped the, uh, whatever company, I guess, build that road, but they weren't paid for their, for their work. So they decided they were going to block traffic until they got paid. And um, this is a very con this is actually a big protest, right? This is a lot of people. But this is a very common thing. They want to block traffic um, and, and get some sort of result. And when the officers see something like this, the procedures are very clear. They've got, to, they've got to get them off the street. You can't have them blocking traffic. Then they want to get them to the side of the street. Then they want to get them into a room. And this is actually out in the countryside. There's not a, a, a local station nearby. But they also want to get them to the station where they can start negotiating, where they can call in the local government officials. So there's a, there's a nice procedure for this, how it works. Uh, and I actually saw another protest that I'll tell you about in Beijing. Again, this was not anything related to my research. I just happened to be walking down the street. And I walk past an apartment complex. A man unfurls this big banner. He's got a head wound. Um, I said, I better, I better step back. And I, I, I want to see what happens here. Uh, and I watch. In about 10 or 15 minutes, uh, a, a patrol car shows up. It's very, very quick. A place like Beijing, the, the response is extraordinarily fast. In other areas, it, it might not be quite as fast, but the, the, the priorities are clear. They can't be blocking traffic. They can't be out in a public area. They can't be protesting in this way. And this is a, these are emotional appeals. One of the officers told me that uh, you know, people will sometimes bring something, that, something to harm themselves or to harm other people. So it's a public safety issue. They want to get them off of the street and into these, uh, into these uh, side places where they can start negotiating. But of course, these are the, the smaller incidents. Sometimes the bigger protests happen. So this is, this is not one that I observed. This is just uh, a picture of the anti-Japan riots in Changsha back in 2012. And you see a, a traffic officer right there. He's got his arms up. This man is unarmed. He's never carried a gun in his life. Uh, he might have shot a few when he was training. Uh, he is not happy. If you were to ask him right now about his ability to control a protest, he is not happy right now. 
But the nice thing about the coordination between the agencies is that this guy knows that help is on the way. They have People's Armed Police squads that are um, stationed strategically throughout the country. They're, they're based there in, in large cities and, and certain other areas. And they have teams of up to 500 men who are ready to go when something like this happens. So the response can be very quick. They're, they're heavily armed. Uh, in fact, the, the, the SWAT guys are really great to interview because they don't do anything on a regular basis except wait for these kind of events. They, they work out all day long. They run laps. They participate in training exercises and competitions with other SWAT teams, just waiting for something like this to occur. And they'll be brought in for big riots, but they can also be brought in anytime there's something that's gotten a little bit too violent. So if you have a few people involved in an incident, the local police say, we can't handle this. There's a call to the ministry. They, they deploy uh, a SWAT team, usually not 100 men, right, if it's something that small. But these are heavily armed, heavily trained officers. And they, incidentally, are also really satisfied in their ability to manage these kind of large-scale events. So that's what unified control looks like. There's a lot of training. There are really clear protocols. You have good coordination among agencies. And police say that they do a good job in this area. Yet, um, it doesn't always work that way. So sometimes with shared control, uh, you can have a lot more problems. And when you see shared control, it's usually an issue that's of a medium priority to the ministry. Uh, the case here, those of you who read Chinese are laughing, this is a big box of marijuana. And what's funny is that uh, they're, they're, they're about to take that to the incinerator. This is, this is in Beijing. Uh, and this is one of the medium priority issues uh, in China, which is kind of surprising to an American audience because it's much higher uh, with, in, in the United States. Uh, and there are other categories with this as well, though. I would say that human trafficking, also probably corruption, though we might see it moving into unified control soon. These are uh, other examples where the ministry is trying to exert some degree of control, but it's not so heavily centralized. So the way that they do this, I, I would say they're somewhat active in that it's mostly about putting out fires. When, um, when something bad happens or there's indication that there, there's a, this, the human trafficking or drug trade is becoming a real problem in an area, uh, whether or not it's in the news, then a team from the ministry will get sent down. But usually that's not coming from the central ministry. Usually that's coming from the provincial ministry, uh, especially with regard to, to drug trade, although that's slightly different with human trafficking. Um, so they're somewhat active, but they're not active in every place. And indeed, drugs aren't even a problem in every place. Human trafficking isn't even a problem in every place. So in three of the cities where I did research, drugs were a problem. And it's here that officers start giving these mixed assessments of their ability to manage crime. And what happens is, you know, there are training programs, but there aren't that many of them. Very few of the officers, even in the areas where, where these kind of activities take place, very few of the officers have ever even participated in them. And there's also poor coordination among the different agencies who are involved. So the People's Armed Police is involved, Border Control is involved, local police and the ministry, but there's not a, there's not a good channel of communication between those different departments to work on these issues. So the results for crime management end up being mixed. Um, and most of this, just to give you another visual, this is a KTV club. This is where a lot of the drug use, I'm going to give the example of drug use. This is where a lot of the drug use happens. And here an officer says, uh, when the provincial, he talks about the relationship that local governments have with KTV bars. That's because corruption at the local level is often tied to the drug trade. So it's either tied directly, like they're getting kickbacks, or it's their friends who are involved. So when they have a relationship in KT, with the KTV clubs and, and the, the drug use like they did in the city where I conducted research, this officer says, when the provincial ministry intervenes, our job gets really difficult, very difficult. Uh, and what he's talking about here is this issue of unannounced raids. So the way they handle uh, drug raids in China, in most cities, is that they call the people up, they call the KTV owners up, and they say, we're going to be there next week, or you know, in an hour, or whatever it is. And so they know that they're coming. 
And the, the reason that they do this is A, because local governments have some sort of relationship sometimes. B, it's the established practice. And, and I would say just beyond that, um, they, they can get these low level users. They can reach their quotas. They're not getting the high level guys, right? They're not getting the suppliers. But they are able to meet their quotas and to develop a, a relationship with those KTV owners so that they know what kind of drugs are in the city, what's being used, what the profile of users are. They get a lot of information from these proprietors. And what happened in the city is the provincial, uh, the provincial ministry got upset. They said the procedure is very clear, you can't do this anymore, you can't call them. And so they said, okay, okay, we'll, 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 we'll conduct unannounced inspections. And they didn't do it, and they didn't do it, and they didn't do it. And so the provincial ministry finally says, we're going to do it ourselves. So they come in a few times, and as you can imagine, um, they don't do that very often until the, the drug users actually start to go underground, right? They're not going to go back to those KTV clubs because that place got raided last week. So what ended up happening with these users underground, the entire response strategy that the, men, that the, the local station had developed over time was decimated. And there were no additional resources, no drug dogs, no extra manpower, nothing that would help them cope with that. And because there was no feedback me mechanism, they weren't able to talk with the provincial ministry and say, hey guys, you know, can we find some sort of other way? Can we, can we find a, a, a compromise? And so in addition, this, this is about getting caught between those two bosses. The lo local governments were also not happy when this happened. Um, and so in addition to that, you see these coordination problems. Here the officer is talking about the drug problem getting out of control. They can't stop it from coming in. He says there's no communication between border police and local police. And then he goes on to complain about not having enough men to create checkpoints. So they can't deal with the drugs, that, 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 they can't use the strategies they've been using in the past. They don't have new resources and they aren't even able to put a checkpoint at the province or the city to stop these drugs from coming in because they don't have that manpower. And in fact, in this particular province, they only have four drug dogs. So you really see how with shared control, police can get caught in a hard place between the local governments and the ministry. And response uh, when that happens does not work very well. But the uh, unfortunate fact of the matter is that it gets worse. So with superficial control, this is that de facto decentralization I was talking about, right? This is when police get left to their own devices. And before I went out, I was looking at like the street level bureaucrats literature and learning about how all of these frontline officials you know, come up with innovation, right? They, they've got a difficult job, but they figure out all kinds of ways to make it better and to cope and to, to improve their, their, their work. And that just did not happen in China. That was not the case. I went out looking for innovation, I asked in 600 different ways, didn't find any innovation. What I found was that officers were struggling under this system, where they said they did not have enough attention from the ministry or even the local governments. And what is unfortunate is that this is the majority of crime that police have to deal with in China. So we're talking about every kind of theft you can imagine. We're talking about murders, white collar crime. The violent crimes fall under this category as well. This is the majority of quote unquote police work in China. And here the ministry uh, is largely inactive. So they, they do provide uh, or they do require training programs. But most of those are carried out on the local level. And I had one officer tell me that it was 95% political ideology and that none of it was useful. There's very little practical information. So they have these training requirements, but they're not actually getting any real training. Then the ministry also supervises what's going on. And yet, um, I had a central ministry official tell me that supervision works really well on the upper levels, the central level, the provincial level, but things really fall apart. He said it's very, very messy at the local level. They're not really able to, to supervise. And then in addition to that, because they want to, to maintain some degree of control, they have these very strict reporting requirements where every single call into the station has has to result in a report. Um, and this is what uh, officers say makes it even more difficult for them to do their jobs because they spend a lot of time writing reports that they say aren't useful. I had one officer tell me that most of what he writes is just false and just, just absolutely fake. He makes it up. 
And then other officers said that you know they they would rather spend that time doing police work, but they had to they had to spend this time with reports. And as you go further up, as you get a promotion, you spend more and more of your time doing reports. So the ministry is being informed. But uh, these officers at the local level say it's very superficial. And so they're largely left to their own devices, and they're coping with what is a low per capita force. There are not that many officers out there, and there are plenty of them that are just working in the office that aren't going out on calls. So it, it really strains these resources that have already been strained in these other areas of policing. And police say they are unsuccessful. So to give you some more examples, this officer talks about not having time to respond to calls. He's complaining that he has to respond to every call. He says, people call about lost dogs, and we have to go out. I had another officer at a county, uh, County Pai Chuso. He said that, that somebody's uh, cow got loose and got stuck in the mud. He had to go out in the middle of the night to get this cow. This is not police work, right? Another person said that somebody lost their QQ number, which is like, I don't know, like your Facebook login or something. It's an old social media site. It's probably an older person, right? Because it's, 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 young people don't use it anymore. Someone lost their QQ number and they had to file a report. They had, they had to go out and, and deal with this issue because that that's the requirement from the ministry. And here's another quote from an officer that I'll read in full because it's so important. He says, we're supposed to have training twice a year, but I haven't been in years. Our officers don't have specific protocols for how to deal with crimes. We don't have deep knowledge of forensics. Anyway, we have no time. So this officer, thinking about this idea of, of protocols or procedures, that's really important. And so he, I, I asked him what he meant by that, and he tells me this story. He says, well, you know, one day I went to, to bust up this, this local hair salon, which is like a, a front for prostitution, right? And he says, I pull up in the patrol car, and as soon as I'm pulling up, the, 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 the boss, the laobat, is running out the door. So he's like, he gets out of his car, he starts running after him. And he says he runs, and he runs, and he runs, and he runs. It's the middle of summer. He's a little bit out of shape. And he gets all sweaty. And he finally, after I don't know how long. He said it was a really long time. I'm not sure how long. Um, he catches the guy. He takes him back to the station. And he's so happy. He's so proud of himself. And the punchline is that everyone in the station, all of his colleagues, laughed at him. They're like, why would you, why would you run after this guy? He, he, was already, he was already gone. You didn't have to open this case. This didn't have to be, you didn't have to get out of breath. There's no procedure for what to do in China when a criminal runs. So most of his colleagues would have just, you know, gotten back in their car and gone on to the next case, right? Because they're, they're very constrained in terms of resources. And, you know, this, this is a funny story, and he was trying to be funny, and, and, and yet he kept talking, and he said, you know, the blood trade is really common in, in that city. There's a lot of underground blood trading going on. Uh, it's a public health problem. It's a public security problem. But there are no procedures. There are no laws. There's nothing that says, you know, this is illegal. And because they don't have a, a deep knowledge of forensic, they don't, often don't have any training at all, if they try to arrest these guys, they're not going to admit guilt. And that, that's the number one thing. When, when, you arrest, when you make an arrest in China, you want them to admit guilt because that's an easy case. It's, it's, it's shut. You, you, you've solved your case. So they would actually have to go out and collect forensic forensic evidence, which they have no idea how to do. And so they just ignore something like the blood trade in this city, even though it's, it's really a problem. And they, you know, some of the officers like this one would like to be involved, but they just don't have the time and they don't have the training and it's just not required. And so this is, um, let me give you one more story because I, I do have a little bit more time to tell my stories. You know, these, these are interesting, sometimes funny examples. But a year and a half ago, there was a horrible example that came up. And this made international press. This was all over the Chinese press. There was a young clerk in Anhui province who was 17 years old. And uh, she saw somebody in her store who was acting erratically, trying to purchase a knife. She called the police. The two police officers show up. The guy, I think, had left, and then he comes back, and he sees that she called the police. He gets upset, and he takes out the knife and starts to stab her. 
And he, what happens is he gets her down on the ground, and there's, there's security footage of this that, that leaked online, so you, you don't watch it, it'll, it'll ruin your day. Um, but, but he gets her down on the ground, and these two police officers, because it's not a gun, right, it's a knife, it takes time to, to kill someone with a knife, these two police office, officers just stand there and watch it happen. And you can tell they're, they're not excited about this. This is not a good thing, right? But they don't know what else to do. They don't have any guns. One of them grabs a box of tissues and throws it at the guy. Um, just completely ineffectual, right? They only step in when he finishes with the girl and turns the knife on himself. And then one of them grabs his pepper spray. And, and guys, it's literally like me trying to kill a roach, right? Like, like just, just very, very scared, very unsure of himself. It's obvious that these guys don't have any training. That's the only thing that he did to stop this crime. And so what happens is this, this footage gets leaked online. And people on Chinese uh, social media just go nuts, right? Because you can't have this. You can't, ha you can't call the police to help you because someone's acting suspiciously and end up getting murdered while they stand there and do absolutely nothing. So people just go absolutely nuts. They end up uh, launching an investigation, and next thing you know it, these guys are back at work. The, the uh, finding of the investigation was that these officers had done nothing wrong. Right? They, this wasn't an open case. This wasn't their case. It's a sad tragedy. We're very sorry for the families, but they've done nothing wrong, and they're, they're probably still working in Anhui province today. And you know that's technically true, right? There's no, there's nothing, there, there's no procedure, there's no law about what police have to do when they see a murder in action. That is technically true. But in the eyes of the public, that is not the case. And you start to see how when when crime gets managed in this way, with superficial control, with few response pr uh, procedures, with not enough resources, with not enough training, with not enough input from the ministry, you start to see how this creates a big public security problem. Uh, so, so, and I'll talk about that in a little bit more in just a minute, but I wanted to just give you the recap. Unified control, that's what we see with protest. It's very centralized. Uh, it's largely effective. This is why we aren't seeing regime change, I would argue, in China, because they're able to really manage these protests and keep, keep it from spreading, keep protesters from connecting up. Shared control, the results are more mixed. Uh, the example was drug trade. Uh, response ends up getting fairly fragmented. Local governments have their say. The ministry has their say. And sometimes it works well, sometimes it doesn't. Superficial control is that last category where most, ca most types of crime fall under. Most crime response categories fall under. Uh, it's localized, and it's not effective. So these are problems when you think about what does this mean? What, what, what is the significance of all of this? I mean, the first thing that it does is it creates a climate of uncertainty, these, these, uh, these patterns of shared control or superficial control. Officers aren't sure which boss they should be listening to. Um, they're also not sure how to respond, like, like with the officers who, saw the, who witnessed the stabbing. And what happens, because the ministry continues to, to exercise control, but in ways that don't really make sense by requiring you to make a report on a lost QQ number, um, this even further limits officer time that's already been constrained by the fact that they don't have a, a very large force to start out with. And then what ends up happening is this creates enforcement problems on the ground. So it starts to affect public security, and it starts to affect people's perceptions of the police. So. Um, there's some research out there, some, some, uh, some surveys that have been published that say there's, there's actually a high degree of trust in the police. Um, I, I don't trust that research. Some of it has been funded by the Ministry of Public Security. Some of it has not. Um, I, it may just be uh, the methodology, but th this is going to be my next project. I'm going to go out and, and see. Because based on my conversations with police, based on my conversations with, with people about police in China, that doesn't really add up. Uh, we, see, we are seeing an increase in the number of attacks against police officers. They didn't use to attack officers. Officers are saying that they don't have the degree of respect. They don't have the degree of power that they had in the 1980s. Um, and here an officer who's a district station officer, uh, actually it's two of them, he says, we're not helping people or solving cases. We're just filling out reports. This is why Chinese people don't like the police. And when you think about cases like that 17-year-old girl, or even like another case that, that, that I was told, I, I, I was in a, uh, an interview and we had a mutual contact present. 
and this woman had, uh, had a break-in into her home. And so she called Yao Yao Ling, which is the, which is not like the 911 number, the emergency hotline. And the local police finally show up, and the police officer gets there, and he starts, you know, he's kind of irritated. He's like, why did you call that number? Why didn't you call our local station number? If you call our lo local station number, you get, you get us here faster, and we don't have to report it up to the higher ups. So you ought to be calling that local station number. And if you look in China, you see all these, all these local stations have their own private number posted there because they want you to call their number and they won't have to file that report if, if, they, if they don't have to. So what he says to her, he says, well, I tell you what, if you call back and you tell them you called in error, I'll fix your front door lock for free. And so that's what she did. She, she got her lock fixed for free. And, and it's funny, right? Because you think about, like, are police officers in China just rolling around town with, with a sack of locks in, their, in the back of their trunks, right? Is, is that how this works? But, but you start to see how this officer hasn't done anything to really solve her problem. He hasn't investigated the crime. Uh, so you start to see how you could, you, could, you could see a loss of trust in police among the public. Now, there are several implications uh, just for this broader, this broader uh, the, the, these observations from the local police. And I'd say the first one is just for studies of the Chinese bureaucracy, right? That category of superficial control is really important because this is where the majority of crimes are falling under. And it's also happening in other agencies. So, so someone from the, who studies the tax bureau told me, oh yeah, this, this is the same thing that's going over here. So we need to think about how that decentralization is not working in the case of China. It's certainly not working for the case of the Chinese police, given all of these other uh, constraints that they have. Uh, it also, of course, has implications for the Chinese people, right? Because you know the, the, the regime is really great at putting down these protests. They, they do a great job. It's bang up, wonderful job. They, they, regardless of what you think about it, they're, they're, they're very effective in this regard. But people don't care about protest. They, they really don't. You know, you talk to people and, and you think about yourself, like, I don't care if you can put down a protest in, in 10 minutes or three days or two weeks. I mean, in, in Berkeley, we've had people in trees when I was on campus, not now anymore. We had people in trees for two years, right? I don't care. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It's not a part of my everyday life. But for, for everyday citizens, and, and the United States is no different than China, people will tell you, like they care that if somebody breaks into their house, or someone hits their car, or there's a business deal that goes wrong, that they're able to call the police, and the police show up and help them with their problem. They file a report, even if they don't get the result that they wanted. They're not just pulling a lock out of the back of the trunk and fixing your lock. They're actually you know, saying, well, if we find anything, we'll call you, not case closed. This was never a case to begin with. So this has, this has, real, um, th this has real meaning for people's lives. And then beyond that, I think we just need to think about authoritarian resilience and the strength of the Chinese security state, which when we've only been looking at protests, and this is not just in China, the authoritarian durability literature looks at coercive capacity and thinks of it only in the sense of, is this gonna take down the regime? Is this protest gonna take down the regime? Do they have the capacity to control that, that protest? But there are all these other things, other ways of, of looking at coercive capacity that involve these other types of crime management, which are also important to people, which also affects the way they feel about a regime, the way they interact with the state, and whether or not they might show up to a protest. So that's why I have this picture, and I've kind of been holding back on it. This is in Wangang County, which some of you may know. It was a, it was a big riot, uh, I think it was in 2011. And this is a police station right there. I, I don't have my, my clicker, but that's a police station right there. And those are two police cars that are actually on fire. And what happened uh, in this case was uh, there was a young girl, again, it's, it's a female victim. Um, there was a young girl who died. And the police said, this is a suicide. And the family said, this, this is a murder. And I don't know what happened. I don't know the case. Um, but I do know that a lot of deaths get classified as suicides because the police have uh, very stringent requirements on keeping the murder rate, the homicide rate down. 
and on increasing their clearance rates. So things get classified as suicides even though they, they might not actually be. And that's what her parents thought had happened. And that's what her neighbors thought had happened and their neighbors neighbors. And suddenly you have this entire event, the police station gets busted out, I think it took, took like a month or something to bring this whole thing under control. And you start to see how this could be a feedback loop back into that protest. So because of police mismanagement in these other areas, you start to see how that could actually be feeding the protests that could be ultimately regime destabilizing. So my argument here is not that this is gonna happen, right? But that we need to be thinking about this. We need to be conscious of this. And when we talk about coercive capacity, when we think about authoritarian resilience, we need to look at it in a very broad way that understands what's actually happening with policing and with the, the coercive control of people on the ground before we start to just say, well, they were able to put down X number of protests last year and they didn't have any problems, none of them stretched for longer than two weeks or, or whatever that measure is. So I'm gonna stop here and, and uh, invite your questions.